So how is everybody this morning? Blessed. Blessed. Yes and amen. So I was, I was going to use like a little visual for you guys this morning. And, and I, in the middle of all my moving stuff around and my wife telling me I have to downsize and get rid of stuff and I can't blame her. I've, I just, I put things in the wrong place. That's the problem. I was about to say she's told me to get rid of stuff, but this has nothing to do with her. I just put it in the wrong place. I used to have a compass. And I was going to bring my little compass as a visual for you this morning, but I don't know. Like I'm lost, you know, I don't have a compass to get me somewhere. So anyway, thank God for technology. Yeah, you, you, I've got it on the watch here now. So I have a compass built in. It's a literal working compass. And the point that I was going to make to you guys is, what, what does the compass do for you? Why do we use them? Point you in directions, right. And if you know how a compass works, that it has the magnetic needle on it that... The needle is drawn to magnetic north of the Earth's center of gravity. It pulls to the northerly direction. So if you have a compass and you're lost and you, you, know, you find that true direction, you can base everything on that and you can, you can you know, go, get where you're needing to go to. They, they kind of help point you in the right direction. Um, I want you to understand, though, that even though you have a sense of where you're supposed to be heading, like if, if I know that I found true north on my compass and I know that I need, I need to be heading due east, and so I turn and I start marching due east off of the northerly direction. If I'm not careful, if I know, like if I want to reach a certain place, like if I want to reach Johnson City, Tennessee, and so I head east, if I vary just a couple of degrees off the mark from where I'm heading to, that can turn up to a major loss in where I actually end up at. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like in, but before GPS became the norm, now nobody uses the compass anymore. We just, you know, say, you know, like, hey Siri, and then she starts talking. And, oh, she is talking. Sorry, I didn't, shut up. <laughs> and you say, take me to wherever, and she brings up the maps, and you just listen, and she just, and of course now with the, the vehicles that we have, you can literally just sit there and sit back and enjoy the music, because your car will drive for you. I mean, it's crazy. But when, like, um, Pilots are taught how to fly a plane, and especially before the GPS. They were taught a, a rule. They call it the, the, um, oh, the one in 60 rule. I was trying to think of what it's called. And the rule states that for every one degree that you are off your course, you will end up being one mile off of course after you travel uh, 60 miles. So for every one degree off, you come a mile off course for every 60 miles that you fly. And you may think, well, that, that's nothing. But look, like, just say, for example, then, that with that rule in mind, that you want to leave New, New York's JFK Airport and you want to fly to Tokyo's Narita International Airport. Okay, that's the, that's the destination. And it's a 14-hour flight. And so if your plane is just one degree off of its course from the time that it starts and it flies 6,755 miles, you will end up 112 miles away from where you wanted to land. And when you're talking flying for 14 hours and you're 112 miles off course, gas becomes a big issue and you're out over the ocean if you're 112 miles off course. That's a big to-do. Can you see how missing the mark by such a fraction can have a devastating end result as to where you think you're headed versus where you end up at? So I, I want to start with that thought in mind this morning because that, that little slight, that little shift can have a major turning point. And we understand that in the natural you know, I can show you how that happens in the natural, but in the spiritual, the same thing can happen. You need a, a true north, if you will, a source that points you in the right direction. And, and that's actually what happens when, when you first listen to and receive the, the gospel message. That becomes your true north. It points you in the right direction. If you believe it in your heart to be true and you receive the Christ, you're now pointed in the right direction, right? Right? But just like with that one little degree of deviation in the compass, the God of this world, our adversary, the devil, he's good at what he does behind the scenes. And when the devil knows that you're on that path, you're now pointed to the right direction, heading towards the kingdom, he knows now that you're on the narrow path, as Jesus refers to it, he doesn't necessarily come up and try to get you to do a 180, like a complete turnaround, because that's drastic, that's dramatic, that's obvious. But what he does do is get you to just take a one or two degree shift from your direction. And all the while, you're like, I'm good. Because I'm heading east, but I've now missed the mark, and I don't even see it. And I want you to understand that 
It's not like big pronounced things that he uses to get you off that deviation. It's little small, subtle, simple things that you never pay any attention to and that many people harbor in their hearts for years and never know that they're off course. This whole weekend and the blessing of this weekend was about forgiveness, large and in part. And although the, you know, anybody that lives in active sin, unrepentant active sin, if you're living in a sinful lifestyle right now, you're, you're not heading towards heaven. You know, unrepentant sin is not going to inherit the kingdom. Paul goes into a long diatribe of things, all these things he says shall not inherit the kingdom. But not everybody realizes that they have things inside of them that are holding them back from going in the direction they think they're going to. And, and unforgiveness is one of those things that people harbor inside of their hearts and they never even realize that it shifted them off of their, their, their path that they think they're walking on. So when we closed out the workshop this weekend, I felt really impressed, especially when I got home yesterday, to, to talk about forgiveness. That, that's the main theme, the main word for the weekend. As I sat and listened to people yesterday sharing story after story after story, account after account, of how the Lord ministered to him and uh, what standing in the gap is that what you, it was an amazing and beautiful time of people doing the very thing that we need a brother or sister in Christ coming alongside of us and, and giving us the opportunity to release the things that we've had pent up inside of us for so long but forgiveness is so desperately needed and the world needs it, absolutely. But what I've become more and more aware of over the last 10 years is how desperately people that have been sitting in churches for decades desperately need forgiveness and to forgive others. We think that the ministry is all out there, and, and yes, desperately, that, that is the, the ministry field, but we've got brothers and sisters that are sitting in these buildings every Sunday that are bound up, and they don't even know it. From start to finish, if you, if you pick up this book and you read it from cover to cover, you will absolutely read forgiveness the whole way through this book. It's most definitely one of the main themes of God's word, forgiveness. And the basic understanding is that mankind sin. We, we fell from a right relationship with God. Is that, is that not what happened in the Garden of Eden thousands and thousands of years ago? Mankind rebelled and they sinned. And it removed us from that right standing, that right position with God. That understanding that we have sinned, as David said in Psalm 51, against you, O Lord, against you alone have I sinned. Daniel said the same thing in Daniel chapter 9, when he, in that beautiful opening discourse of Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel's repenting before the, the Father. He says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against Him. And the thing that's so beautiful, that even though we rebelled against God, Yahweh has always shown and proven himself to be loving and forgiving towards his people. Even when they repeatedly rebel against him, go against his laws, his commands over and over again, Yahweh is always faithful in offering forgiveness. When you go back and you read the, the Exodus account, and you get to the part where Moses is up on the mount, God's given Moses the commandments, and you know what happens to people who rebel? as they always do, and they create the golden calf, and they're down there worshiping it. And then after that happens, when you know, Moses smashes the tablets and grinds up the calf and makes the people drink the gold dust. And the Bible says that God calls Moses back up on the mountain. And Moses asked for something that to me is one of the most profound things in the word of God. God, show me your glory. And God says, okay, I'm going to bring you back up here tomorrow and get ready. And he says, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to pass my goodness, my presence before you. And this is what God says as he passes by Moses. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will know by, by no means clear the guilty. Look, look, look at what God is saying. Of all the things that he could have said when he's passing by Moses, God said to him, I'm going to keep going with my people. I've made a covenant with my people. I'm going to keep going with you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to direct you. And I forgive sin. 
Mankind sinned against God and against his will from the beginning. But instead of God seeking, as we would in the flesh, instead of God seeking retribution and, and personal vindication and vengeance upon us, look at what the Word of God says that he actually did. Romans 5, 8, Paul says, But God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his own Son to die upon the cross for our transgressions. And in doing so, he showed us what forgiveness truly looks like. Keep that in mind. Mankind wronged God, not the other way around. And yet he's the one. God's the one that went out of his way to reconcile this relationship, to, to bring us back into a right relationship with him. He's the one that went to great lengths to forgive you and I of our sins Although we're the ones that sinned and wronged him. He went out of his way to make it right again. And then just two verses after that, Paul goes on and he says this in verses 10 and 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I want you to understand exactly what this passage says to us. Before Jesus the Christ went to the cross of Calvary, mankind, from, from the fall of Adam and Eve and all the way up, mankind was eternally an enemy of God because of a disease that it carried known as sin. There was no way that any person could ever go back into the glorious presence of God again with the disease of sin in him because sin is not allowed in God's kingdom. There was no good works, there was no good deeds that anybody could do to bring them back into right standing with God. Now yes, absolutely, if you go back and you read through the Old Testament, there was absolutely men and women that were faithful, that loved the Lord God, that served Him in the Old Testament. But understand this, had Jesus Christ not gone to the cross, not shed His blood for the forgiveness of their sins, and they had not been covered by the blood of Christ, they would have died eternally separated from the Father. So you have to consider what Paul is saying. We were enemies of God until Jesus Christ went on that cross. Our flesh in the natural state is at enmity with, with the Spirit, with, with God. Paul goes into this whole discourse about that in Romans 7. He talks about the, how that his flesh and his spirit are constantly warring against each other. And that's exactly the state of the natural man because we are fallen. The day that you draw your first breath, you are a fallen creature. And the only way that you can come back to right standing with the Father is through the redemptive blood of Jesus the Christ covering you. I've said before, it saddens my heart when ministers don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ because I said the blood's a nasty subject. You better believe it's a nasty subject. Jesus Christ paid a horrible price to redeem us. Praise God. But that's why Paul says that we were enemies with God. But God. The two best words in the Bible, but God, who is rich in his mercy and not willing that any should perish, sent his own son at the right time and made him the propitiation for our sins. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit. And this all happened because of God's great desire and His will to forgive you and I of our sins and to bring us back into an intimate relationship with Him as, as our great Lord. But a person doesn't enter into the kingdom of God unless they are first forgiven by God. Now some people say, well, we're already forgiven. You know, everybody's forgiven. That Christ forgave and He said it on the cross. Father, forgive them. And, and we're already forgiven. You're never truly forgiven and enter the kingdom of God until you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus the Christ. And I said, like, if somebody acknowledges they've done a lot of wrong things and they're like, ah, hey, sorry God, my bad. That's not redemption. They're not forgiven of their transgressions just because they say that. That truly happens the moment that you hear the gospel and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, that he died upon the cross, a spotless, sinless death that he died, his blood was shed for the forgiveness of your sins, and that you realize, I need a Savior, and you cry out and repent, which means you turn away from the life of sin, and you receive him as Lord and Savior, and he puts his spirit in you. You have now been found forgiven and justified, as the word says, in the eyes of Almighty God, right? But 
people say, well, you know, I told God that I was sorry. I, I pray to God. You know, that's called lip service. God, all the way back through the prophet Isaiah, said, therefore, inasmuch as these people draw near me with their mouths, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and they pay attention to the commands of men more than my commandments. God doesn't care about your lip service. You can say, I love you, Jesus, 33,000 times a day, and that doesn't mean you truly love Jesus, because it's your heart that he wants. Like Will said a minute ago, where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where, what do you treasure? A right rela relationship with him, or do you just offer him lip service? I, I mean, I see people that are still doing like the little prayers that we were taught when we were kids. You know, God is good, God is great, let us thank him for our food, by his hands we are fed, give us Lord our daily bread, amen, let's eat. They're still praying those same prayers as adults. C.S. Lewis referred to him in the screw tape letters as our parrot prayers. We just mimic and repeat over and over and over again. But that's not redemption, and that's not forgiveness. A person is truly forgiven when Jesus Christ becomes their Lord and Savior. And being born again is what brings us into right standing with Almighty God. That is, you have truly been forgiven of those sins. And that's when you find yourself, as I was mentioning with the compass, when you know you're heading in the right direction because you know that your life is now secure in the hands of our Master. And if you, if you can even think back to that moment, what it felt like when all the weight of the sin was lifted off of you. It's like the woman when he was sitting at Simon the Pharisee's house and the woman comes in and starts washing Jesus' feet with her tears and anointing his feet. And they're like, what is it? She's a sinful woman. And Jesus made the analogy and he draws the conclusion to the one who has been forgiven much, they love much. Have you been forgiven? Do you remember what that felt like when that weight, that pain was lifted off of you? That's what God did for us, and that's what we're supposed to do for others. We are supposed to forgive. Forgiveness is one of those words that you'll hear a lot used in the Christian faith. You hear it used in churches all the time, and it sounds good, but it's not always the easiest thing to walk out in the flesh, right? So that being said, is, is forgiveness towards other people in our lives an option for the true believer of Jesus Christ? And before I go into any details about that, I just want to say a few things about what forgiveness truly is and what it truly isn't. And then we'll get back to the first question. So what is forgiveness in the truest sense? Well, if you look up definitions, you'll get a vague answer, but it's, it's basically the act of pardoning an offender or releasing an offender. If you look up in the New Testament and you study like in Greek lexicons and you look at the words that are used for forgiveness, there's two primary words that are used that represent forgiveness. The first one is aphemiai, if I'm saying that correctly. Sounds good. And it refers to letting go or releasing, as in canceling or releasing someone from a debt. Matthew 6, 12, Jesus says, and forgive us. Talk, this is when he's given the model prayer. And he says, and forgive us. That, that word right there, forgive us, is that same word. He's saying, forgive us, or let go of, or release our debts, Father, as we also forgive our debtors. That's what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. He released he paid the price. That, that very famous, beautiful three words that he uttered at the end, it is finished, is that Greek word tetelestai. And it means it is finished. But it was also a word that stood for paid in full. That's what happened on the cross. Jesus was saying to the Father, to all that would come to him, their sins are paid in full. Done. That's what that Greek word means. To forgive. And the second Greek word that's used for forgiveness in the Bible is charizomai. And it means to forgive, to give graciously, to give freely, to bestow. That same word is, comes from the Greek word charis, which is where we get our word grace. And that is truly what the forgiveness of God is in our lives. It is God's grace that he extends to us. And that's how much he loves us, that he gives us that grace. You can see that word used where Paul writes in Ephesians 5.32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, showing grace to one another as God has forgiven you. Can you see the grace of God being extended from one person to another in that passage of how that what we've received, Jesus said, freely you've received, freely you'll give. That's what we're supposed to do with each other. So forgiveness is pardoning someone or bestowing the grace of God upon them and releasing them from a debt. 
That's what it is in the most general sense. Now let me tell you a few things that forgiveness is not. Biblical forgiveness is not an emotional feeling that you're supposed to have. Like some people, when somebody has wronged them, um, they'll, they'll say something like, um, I just don't feel like the Lord is releasing me to forgive you yet. That's heresy. That's antithetical to the Word of God. It's poor interpretation. You are never to wait for a feeling to release somebody in forgiveness. Forgiveness is an act of will. It is born out of the love of God that we have received in our hearts by His Holy Spirit being placed within us. That's what the Word of God says. But it's not a feeling. We have too many people that are always looking for feelings and how they respond to God. Your natural mind and your emotions will always run contrary to the will of the Father. Our flesh does not want to fall in alignment. That's why when you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, and as Paul talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that you begin to read the Word of God and you yield your life as, as a, a holy um, um, sacrifice before God and you're being conformed and renewed by the transforming of your mind, and your, your, your mind, your natural mind, is saying to your spirit, I've been in charge of this vessel a whole lot longer than you have, so we're doing it my way. And your spirit's going, no, actually we're doing it God's way. And your flesh is like going, nope, been here a lot longer than you have, dude, so I'm doing it my way. And this is every day of your life. The two are constantly battling it out. So when you wait for a feeling, your flesh is not going to give you the feelings that are conducive to how God wants you to live. The natural mind is against the spirit. Biblical forgiveness is not ignoring or denying that you were hurt or wronged in some way. Like, like some people are afraid that if they, if they forgive somebody, that what they're really saying is, even though you've hurt me horribly, you've wronged me, it just didn't happen because now I'm releasing you so it just never happened. That's not what it means. You're not ignoring, nor is anybody else ignoring or denying the hurts, the wrongs that took place. You're releasing them from a debt as God released you from a debt. But nobody's ignoring anything. Biblical forgiveness is not condoning what the offender has done to you. When, when you forgive someone, no matter how heinous the offense was, you're not saying to that person, nor are you implying to that person that you forgive them, that you're just sweeping everything under the rug and that it's all okay now because they've done something horrible against you. Like, if a man murders his spouse, or, or anybody, it doesn't matter, and the family of that person comes up to him and, and forgives them, the court's not going to go, okay, well, they've forgiven you, so we're just going to strike it off the record. It's all swept under the rug. No, no. He still has to answer and pay for the sin that he's committed. So releasing someone in forgiveness is not saying we're just sweeping it under the rug. No, they're still very much accountable for what they've done. Um, trust is something, when, when you talk about forgiveness, that's another thing that people say, well, I, I, I want to forgive that person, but I can't ever trust him again. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Trust is something that is earned. And when somebody breaks that trust, you can forgive them, release them, but you may never trust them again. The Bible doesn't command us to trust one another, love one another, release and forgiveness one another, but trust is not something you have to... You don't have to hang out with them anymore because you forgave them. You understand that? Like we have this mindset, well, if I forgive you, that means we're just all buddy-buddy. No, it, no, it, no, it didn't. But forgiveness begins the healing process of your wounded heart. I can tell you that much. And in saying that, did, did you know honestly that when you, when you forgive someone a wrong that they've done to you, when you release them in forgiveness, did you know that it literally brings physical health and healing on your body? John Hop, Johns Hopkins University and the Mayo Clinic have both done studies on this. Physiological studies... I want you to listen to the benefits that they've both said. These are secular studies. This isn't some Christian um, study. Secular studies. These are the benefits of releasing people in forgiveness. You have healthier relationships with other people. That's one of the things that they talked about this weekend is that you're free to love people again. When you release in forgiveness, it allows you the ability to begin to love others truly and have better relationships with other people. It improves your mental health. You have less anxiety, less stress, less hostility. 
You have fewer symptoms, symptoms of depression. You have lower blood pressure, a stronger immune system. You have improved heart health, and it reduces dramatically the chances of you having a heart attack. It improves your self-esteem, it improves your cholesterol levels in your sleep, and it reduces pain, physical pain, in your body. Literally, forgiveness is medicine for your body and healing for your soul. Do you understand that? Say that again. Unforgiveness is poison, that's right. It's like... When you don't release, it's like you drinking rat poison and expecting it to kill the other person. Exactly. Which way do you want to live your life? Do you want it to be healthy and full of the blessings of God? Or do you want to live with all the nasty stuff that happens when you hold in unforgiveness? I want the good stuff. I'm just being honest with you. So in saying that, if I've wronged any of you and I've never said forgive me, please forgive me. Because I want to make sure that we're clear on that. But I asked you a few minutes ago if forgiveness towards other people in our lives as Christians is it an option. And I think you all unanimously said no. But there was a study done this year um, where they were asking people about the, the act of forgiveness in our nation. Up to 94% of people say it's important to forgive, but only 48% say they usually try to forgive themselves. Women are more likely than men to forgive after being hurt by someone close to them. Uh, my sister shared with me this morning about how that the statistics are showing there's a huge decrease in men that are studying and reading the Word on a regular basis as compared to women, like half. And that's a shameful disgrace to, to the role that God gave to man to be the spiritual head of the house. That's shameful. And the fact that women are much more likely to forgive and study in the Word of God when the man's supposed to be leading the house, what does that say about the direction of our nation? Way down. About 62% of American adults say they need more forgiveness in their personal lives. And 62% of adults view forgiveness as being conditional on the offender making some form of restitution or apology. It's conditional on the offender. So that being said, what is the Bible's stance on our forgiving others? Is, is it an option? Is it conditional and based upon the level of offense that's been committed against you? Can we withhold the grace of forgiveness that God has given to us until we deem it necessary to give it to the other person? No. Matthew 18. That's the account where we find Jesus talking about how that we handle offenses. Um, he said that, you know, remember, if you've ever read through how Jesus says to handle offenses in the church body, he says that if somebody has sinned against you, go to that person and tell them what they've done wrong. And if that person receives it and they repent, then you receive your brother or sister back in Christ. But if they withhold and they deny it, the Bible says to take two or three witnesses with you, go back to the person and again present it to them in the hopes that repentance and forgiveness can be given. And if they still deny it, Jesus says, bring it before the whole church body. And if they still refuse to allow the healing to take place, he says to consider them like a tax collector or a pagan. Get them out of the body. And you're like, that's pretty harsh. Now you're starting to understand how God views unforgiveness. It's a sickness. It's a disease. It's a cancer in the body. Just like I've said before, we're so quick to point our little righteous fingers at other people's sins. Oh, that homosexual, they're a sinner. That, that drunkard, they're a sinner. That, that drug addict, they're a sinner. Yet you'll go out here as soon as the service is over with and you'll murmur and gossip about somebody and the Bible calls you an abomination. Mmm. Well, that means I need to be stepping on some toes because I know for a fact that it goes on in every church in this nation. You need to clear the offense. And that's what Jesus was saying in Matthew 18. Get it out of the body because if you leave it in the body, it will spread like cancer. And he's not saying that I want you to get rid of them and just turn them over to the devil and leave them. He's saying get them out in the hopes that they'll repent and come back in right standing and be brought back into the body again. He says the same thing when you look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 5 and then going into 2 Corinthians when you see a brother in Christ that was ousted because of unrepentant sin and then he's allowed to come back in again in right standing because he repents and gets himself right with Jesus. But you've got to remove this stuff from your presence. If you hang out with people that have a nasty habit of holding grudges, stop hanging out with them. Amen. I mean, show them the love of Christ and point them in the right direction. But man, if that's all they do is harbor ill will and hatred and, and all this vitriol towards other people, you need to stay away from that. Birds of a feather, you know what I'm saying? And one thing that I want you to stress, that I want to stress to you about what Jesus was saying in Matthew 18, about if you know that somebody sinned against you, go to that person. Jesus doesn't say wait until they come to you to try to clear the air. You go. 
you be the one that makes the step towards reconciliation. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 26, when Jesus is given his Sermon on the Mount, this is what he says. So is, he says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember while you're there that someone has anything against you, leave the sacrifice right where it sits at the altar, go and become reconciled to that person, then come back and offer your sacrifice before God. Do you, do you understand what he's saying? He doesn't say if you get there and you remember that you have something against somebody else. No, he says if you get there and you remember somebody's got something against you, go instantly. Stop everything and go clear the offense. Let forgiveness and the healing of God and the grace of God take over that situation. Fix it. That's a command. That's what, that's what the Christ says. As soon as you recognize it, go clear it up. Don't sit and wait for them to come to you because that day may never happen. It's our obligation and command by God to go and fix the situation, to make sure forgiveness is in place as much as possible. Not to mention that when we hold unforgiveness, if you know that you have it in your heart and you hold it, you're poisoning the body of Christ. Every time you get around other people and you hold this inside of you, it's like a toxin. Like I said, it's like a poison. It's, it's a sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. That's the best way I can put it. Anything that transgresses the will of God is a sin. And so like when you go further into Matthew 18 and you find where Peter comes up to Jesus, after Jesus talks about how we are to interact and to deal with each other in the body of Christ, Peter comes up and says, Lord, like how often, if my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive him, Jesus? Up to seven times, Jesus? If you understand the rabbinical teachings of that day and age, the rabbis were teaching this. If a fellow Jew commits a sin against you, if they harm you, do anything against you, you, you forgive them. If they do it again, you forgive them. If they do it again, you forgive them. And then you stop. Three times is the max that you forgive that person for their transgression. So here comes Peter up to Jesus. Lord, if, if my brother keeps offending me, how many times should I forgive him, Jesus? Up to seven, Jesus? More than double the rabbinical teachings, Jesus? Accolades, look at me, Jesus. I'm saying seven. And then what does Jesus say to him? Seventy times seven. Peter, you, he says, Peter, you're not even in the right ballpark. You're in another universe, son. In other words, you're trying to put a legalistic stance on it. My father is telling you, Peter... Every time they come back, you have to forgive and release them. Because the moment you say no, you're harboring and holding, and the devil gains ground, and God's been deglorified in that situation. The bait of Satan. That's exactly it. The bait stick. The, uh, what's, that, what's that Greek word? Uh, it'll, it's the scandalon. The bait stick. That's what he uses. The offense is the bait stick. Seven times seventy, forgive them. Every single time they come back. He goes on and he says in that passage in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 18, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. Jesus says, here's the answer, Peter, and I'm going to give you a parable to back it up. So he says there's this king, and he had slaves, and he wanted to settle all of his accounts with all of his slaves. And so the Bible says he had this one slave that owed him 10,000 talents. Now, we think 10,000 talents, we're thinking $10,000. That's not what it means. As a matter of fact, a talent, if I'm not mistaken, in that day and age was uh, up, like more, a talent was worth more than 15 years of hard labor. This guy owed the king 10,000 talents. So he owed him in excess of $3.5 billion worth of money in today's standard. And so the king says, pay up. And the slave drops before the master and starts crying, please, please have mercy, dear, dear plea master, please have mercy on me. I'll do whatever I have to do. Because the, the king was saying, I'm going to sell you, your family, your kids, everything, whatever I can do to get some of my money back. And he's like, please have mercy on me, please, I'll do anything. And Jesus says the master had, he felt sorry for him, he had pity on him. And, he, and so he didn't just say, I'll make a deal with you, we'll cut a deal. He just flat out says, I release you completely of your debt. And then he leaves the master's presence and he goes to somebody that owes him money. And the guy only owes him a few thousand dollars. Not three and a half billion, but a few thousand. And he's like, I want my money back. 
And the guy's like, please, please, I'll do whatever I have to. I'll do anything to, to, to pay you back. And he's like, nope, you don't pay me now or you're going to jail and you'll stay there until you can pay it back. So the word gets back to the master of what this guy did. And the master calls him back in and he's like, you wicked servant. I forgave you what I did and you can't forgive a brother for the little thing that he's done? So he says, here's what's about to happen to you, Chuckles. I'm going to bind you and cast you in a place of torture until you can pay off your debt. And the reason why Jesus made it as large as it was, 10,000 talents, is because there is no way and no length of time you'll ever be able to pay it back. We could never pay back our debt to God that we owed Him because of our sin. Do you understand that? So God is saying through Jesus, I forgave you this immeasurably large debt. You better be forgiving each other because there's nothing that anybody can do you do that's more great than what my son bore on the cross for the sins of the world. You have to forgive. It's a command. The Bible's kind of big on those things. Paul said in Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3.13, Bearing with one another, if, if, if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. It's a command. I had somebody say to me one time in my family, because we had this big riff in our family one time, and he said, you know, I, I, I choose to not harbor ill feelings, but I just I don't feel like I can forgive this person. And I said, well, you have to forgive him. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, the Bible says that you should. I said, no, the Bible says you must. And I took him that passage. Must. I don't know how you read that word must. You must forgive. It's not an option for a true believer. God has forgiven us a debt that we could never out pay back, and we must forgive others. Um, Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty five, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. How many people can honestly say that you've noticed before there's times in your life where everything is going just horribly wrong? Horribly. And you, you'll, you'll say to other people, it's, it's like it doesn't matter. No matter how much I pray, it's like God's just not listening to me. Ask yourself the question, is there unforgiveness in your heart towards anyone? You say, well, I used to, you know, Steve and I had a falling out one time, but, you know, we, we worked past that, did you? Because when you see Steve on the streets or you see Steve in the church or somebody talks about Steve, do you start getting anger inside of you? Because you've not forgiven Steve yet. You're still harboring something against the other person. And the Bible's very clear. If you don't forgive, and it comes from your heart, not your mouth, then God's not going to forgive you, no matter what you say. And the level of the offense is not up for discussion with God. Like some people want to say, well, no, wait a minute, God. And, and you can make it the most heinous crime you can possibly imagine. You don't understand, God. Look at what this person did to me or to my family. There is no discussion with God. You must release. And not just because He's God, but because, as we've already seen, once you hold ill will and unforgiveness in your heart, it begins to eat away at you and it destroys your relationship with Him. It pulls you off course with Him and it begins to ruin your family and everyone else. Unforgiveness is a toxin. It's a poison. God didn't withhold from you and you do not have the right to withhold it from somebody else. Same thing again, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. No matter how you cut it, forgiveness is a command. Luke 6, when Jesus talks about judge not and you will not be judged, condemn not, you will not be condemned, forgive and you will be forgiven. He's talking about how we interact with people, how we're not supposed to criti critically judge people through critical eyes when you've got sin in your own life. And then he says to us, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. I hear people teach sometimes using that as an example of why we should give money. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He was not talking about money or finances in any way, shape, form, or fashion. He's talking about how you deal with people. And your heart's a, a, a willingness to release people in forgiveness or your heart's desire to be critical and judge them is what's going to come back on you. So when you say to somebody, I I'll forgive you this much, but the rest of it, nah. Well, there you go. 
Do you not think that God sees that? Okay, that's fine. You're not going to release them, so this is how I'm going to treat you from now on. I don't want God's you know, wrath coming down on me. I'm just being honest with you. So, i close out here. Mark Twain once made this statement. He said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. In other words, forgiving others' wrongdoings, even when they've hurt you horribly, when you release in forgiveness, it's like a sweet fragrance that is given off. And it was pain and anguish that brought about that fragrance, that forgiveness. In all the years that I worked in long-term health care, and I, it was almost 18 years that I worked, I worked in a lot of nursing homes all over the three different counties I worked in nursing homes. And I was exposed a lot of times to terminally ill patients. And anybody that's ever worked in that setting long enough, as well as people that I know of that have volunteered to work through hospice that are dealing with terminal people, one of the things that you'll see, a continuum across the board, is the brokenness of people's lives because they desire so very much to have reconciliation with somebody that they've hurt in their life. They know that the days are closing in rapidly and they want so desperately to get reconciliation. There's a story that a hospice ro uh, worker wrote. Um, it's, it's a while back, but she wrote, 20 years before I met my patient, Jean, 20 years before we met, she had abandoned her teenage daughters and her husband, walked out on them to pursue another lifestyle. Now, dying of emphysema, the only thing that she wants is for her daughter's forgiveness. But even though they knew she was dying, they refused to see her or talk to her. I suggested that we write a forgiveness letter. Jean agreed on the condition that they get it after I die. For three weeks, she dictated and I wrote. And after many starts and stops and numerous crumpled sheets of paper being tossed and thrown away, we finally had something that she felt good about me giving to her daughters. All of the hard work that she had done for three weeks was wrapped up in this. She said, please forgive me. I've always loved you. And it was enough to give her some peace before she died. Dear friends, don't wait until the end of your life to try to make things right with those that you know that there's unforgiveness, hurts, offenses. Yeshua stressed the fact you're supposed to drop everything and go make it right, right then. Right then. Not I'll do it tomorrow, I'll message him next week. You're not guaranteed next week. Because that, that forgiveness will hold your spiritual compass in the place that it needs to be leading you in the path of righteousness. Would you...